Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. So this last knowledge bomb that I did, there was one question in there that I noticed in the comments that I thought was really, really excellent and really hit the nail on the head when it comes to how confusing acoustic tips can be when you try and put them together, because some of these tips can be so contradictory if you try and actually apply them in real life. So here's that comment. It is by Nunya Bisfam. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Excellent question, though. And they say this. I noticed a few things that seem contradictory that I would love to have cleared up. Number one. In the Genelec manual, it says to have the back of my monitors placed at least four inches away from the wall for the base port to have enough room to operate properly and also to have the front of my monitors no more than 24 inches from the front wall. Number two, but then a bunch of articles I have read mentioned the 38% rule for your listening position. In quotation, your seating position should be 38% of the length of the room facing the short wall. Number three, then I read in a few places that the best way to set up your speakers is to, for each inch of the woofer size, have them set one foot apart, i.e. six inch woofer would be six feet apart, and then have your listening position at 87% of that, i.e. six feet times 87% is five feet, two and a half inches, equidistance from each speaker at the head of the triangle. I don't see how these can all be implemented simultaneously. So if they are all optimal positions for their respective part in their setup, then how can you truly set up a perfect room? I love this because it highlights a big problem that I see with so much acoustic advice out there, right? On its own, it seems to make sense, but when you try and put it together, Sometimes they're like, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. And sometimes it's literally contradictory and you don't know what to do. Right. And the main issue with all of these is that they're usually out of context because it just matters so much what quality you're aiming for with your room, basically kind of what tier of studio quality you're aiming at makes a huge difference in terms of which advice to implement what you can and should do with your studio is just so different when you're building a 100k room from scratch in comparison to if you're just turning your spare bedroom or a spare basement into your home studio and you've maybe got one or two thousand dollars to work with what you can do and what you should focus your attention on varies enormously depending which of those you fall into. It really dictates how much you should pay attention to each of these tips and when to actually implement them in the process of setting up and treating your studio. Another tip to throw into this confusing list of speaker placement tips is just the equilateral triangle, right? How are you supposed to set up your listening position correctly follow the equilateral triangle rule, follow the right distance to your speakers rule, follow the right distance of your speakers to your walls rule, all in one. It doesn't work, especially if you're in some oddly shaped room, it just all falls apart. And then the question becomes, which tip do you follow? The short answer is, well, you can't follow all of them and you really shouldn't, not all of them anyway. And I'll explain that in a second so you understand how to put this into practice. But first, let me just jump into these questions and answer them individually to give you context. And then we'll see how we can tie all of this together into a structure, into a system, into a process that actually makes sense. So question one. In the general manual, it says to have the back of my monitors placed at least four inches away from the wall for the base port to have enough room to operate properly. And also to have the front of my monitors no more than 24 inches from the front wall. Really, these are two tips in one. The first one is about the functioning of the port. And the basic idea is that the port needs space behind it, with rear ported speakers, obviously, to ha to have unrestricted airflow, right? To not hinder that airflow and keep the resonance port from functioning properly. 
there are many theories about this out there. From what I found, the idea is pretty simple. As long as the distance to your port is the same or larger than the diameter of the port, you should be fine, right? So in essence, you can really pretty much go up right up against the wall with your speakers. Usually they're angled anyway and that that little air gap, that little gap that you need in order for the port to work uh, properly usually gets created pretty much on its own. Maybe you'll need to pull them back just a tiny amount, but that's enough. The second part of this, and also to have the front of my monitors no more than 24 inches from the front wall. So this is about speaker boundary interference, right? The idea is to keep the speaker close enough to a boundary in order for the boundary effect, which is basically just sound bouncing off the wall, reflecting back to the speaker and then interfering with the sound as it's leaving the membrane. There's a standard interference that happens at that moment, just like with your standard mirror point reflection, and it causes a boost in energy for the in-phase component. And at some point that reflected energy will be out of phase depending on the frequency and the wavelength and then you'll get a massive dip. This is what's usually called speaker boundary interference response. So that's that's kind of how we, uh, that's the, the phrase we use to describe that particular problem, uh, the dip that happens as a consequence of the interference of the boundary effect, right? Obviously, there are, there's the in-phase component as well. That's the boost that we're usually talking about, but that's a different topic. The point is, the further you move the speaker away from the wall, the lower down in frequency that out-of-phase component will be, and so that dip in the frequency response will also be lower down. By having the speakers closer to the boundary, closer to the surface, that out of phase component is so high up in frequency that it doesn't ruin the bass response anymore. I've written a, an extensive article about this that I'll link in the description uh, that I wrote on Sonic Scoop, which goes through the exact details of what this looks like so you understand what this is trying to, to do. Okay? That's what this tip is about. Let's just leave it at that for the moment. The second question, a bunch of articles I've read mention the 38% rule for your listening position. Your seating position should be at 38% of the length of the room facing the short wall. So this is about optimizing the low end response by placing your ear at a position in the room where the front to back axial room mode gives you the right amount of energy, okay? This is super theoretical. It only applies to one dimension of the room, and it really only works if the two surfaces, the front and back surface of the room, are 100% reflective. Yeah, The more you deviate from that system, that premise, the less this will work. And it's actually not a rule, it is a guideline. I can't remember exactly who came up with it or what his name was. I remember, I know who it is, but I can't remember his name right now. But he said an acoustician who does wonderful work and he he postulated this as a guideline, as a starting point. It's been turned into a rule ever since, but it's really a guideline to start looking for the right listening position. This only looks at room mode patterns in a room. This doesn't include where the speaker is positioned and what the speaker's position in relation to the boundaries is, right? So already we can see that these first two basically are, basically are out of context tips that on their own make sense, but there's nothing that tells you how to tie them together, okay? Let's go to the third one. Then I read in a few places that the best way to set up your speakers is, is to, for each inch of the woofer size, have them set one foot apart, i.e. six inch woofer would be at six feet apart, and then have your listening position at 80%, 7% of that, i.e. six feet times 87% equals five feet and two and a half inches equidistant from each speaker at the head of the triangle. 
I have no idea where this came from. Yeah, I've never heard this before. I, to me, this doesn't make any sense at all. It has no basis in any acoustic theory. <laughs> uh, I would right off the bat say, just ignore this. It makes no sense whatsoever. It has no place in the actual reality of placing speakers in room. So I would just completely ignore this. So let's tie this together so you understand what it is you should be paying attention to. And we need to talk about priorities at this point, right? Because again, in, in, on their own, at least the first two points make sense. The question is, how do you implement them? Which one do you pay attention to? Which one do you prioritize depending on your room? And this I have to make a disclaimer here. This, the advice I give is for home studios. You might consider this differently if you're building from scratch, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about home studio, turning a basement, a bedroom, an odd shaped room that you have available into your home studio, okay? And the way to think about this is the following. The placement of your listening position optimizes the low end response, broadly speaking, or bro across a broader chunk of the spectrum, because you are choosing the balance of various different room modes against each other, right? So when you're choosing your listening position, although the 38% rule really only talks about one one direction, one mode. In practice, you are optimizing various different room modes. At the very least, the, the, the front to back room mode and its harmonics. But we're also thinking about the width mode. We're also thinking about the height mode. Those are only the axial modes, but then there are also tangential and oblique modes which are basically just more complex reflection patterns and their effect isn't as strong, but they play into the actual balance that you get. And when you position, when you choose your listening position, you're basically trying to find the spot that gives you the, the least bad spot in terms of all these room modes and how much energy you're getting from each of them. The important thing is that this affects a large frequency band, basically the entire low end. The speaker placement question, when we're talking about the boundary effect, does affect the same region, if you will, but where the, the main culprit, the main problem that the tip is trying to optimize for is that dip that creates gets created at a specific frequency. So when you're weighing these two tips against each other, you're weighing a, a, a technique that tries to optimize the entire low end bandwidth against a technique that tries to optimize for one specific dip. You tell me which one of those is more important. Well, obviously the one that optimizes for the entire bandwidth, yeah? So when we're talking about these two, these two tips, the second one is way more important than the first one. The second reason why the speaker placement in relation to the boundaries is less important is a very practical one. And that is that you're not really just optimizing for the speaker position in relation to the wall behind the speaker, AKA the front wall of your room, the one that you're facing, but also the side walls, the floor, the ceiling, those are all boundaries that the speaker will interact with. And this effect, this dip that you get from speaker boundary interference doesn't just happen on the front wall, the wall behind the speakers. It also happens, or it can also happen on the side wall. I've definitely seen that it can happen on the floor, the ceiling, as I mentioned. So I, really, if you want to complete this tip, it should say, also have the front of my monitors no more than 24 inches from any surface, not just the front wall. And at that point, we're starting to get into a territory where this doesn't really make sense in practice because you can't really do that 
the obvious thing that is also missing from this speaker placement advice is the fact that as a mixer, as the person actually using this system, you need a stereo soundstage to work off of. If you don't have that, you cannot place elements in the stereo image. It just doesn't work. So more important than where any of a potential dip caused by speaker boundary interference sits, more important than that when it comes to speaker positioning is, do I get a proper stereo image? Because I can't work without a proper stereo image. I can work, if there's a dip somewhere, I can, I can work around that, but I can't work if I don't get a proper stereo image and a proper phantom center. Okay, so in, when we look at this tip in context of what it is you're trying to do in the first place when you're setting up your speakers, the, the basic advice, that the advice that I give is actually to, to completely ignore the speaker boundary interference issue because it has, it, it's not important enough at this stage, especially when you're setting up your home studio because you might end up with a speaker position if you try and follow this rule that completely destroys any chance of having a proper stereo image. And so the only way to deal with this properly is to ignore it and to just eat the cost of having a potential speaker boundary interference issue at this stage, right? Because you can also treat speaker boundary interference issues with absorption. At least you can minimize the effect if they even appear, right? And you can also, with treatment of the room, buy yourself more freedom in terms of getting closer to the different boundaries of your room, basically giving you more flexibility of counteracting this effect, the speaker boundary effect, by optimizing your speaker placement or changing your speaker placement once you have treatment in the room, yeah, but not before. Right. So to go full circle with this, the first thing you want to focus on, and now you probably understand why I keep saying this over and over again, is the listening position, because that's the biggest lever you can pull in order to optimize the frequency response in the low end, because the listening position affects the entire low end, not just one specific frequency. Yeah. Okay. I'm exaggerating here. As I mentioned before, yes, the speaker boundary effect does affect a broader section, but in essence, the room modes effect on the low end balance is much stronger. And because room modes are also much harder to damp with acoustic treatment, you can obviously do that, but its effect isn't as great. You want to focus on your listening position first. And then when you set up your speakers, you want to focus on the stereo image and the tonal balance you're getting by ear. And you just forget about the speaker boundary interference thing and at what distance your speakers are from your different boundaries in your room because you can't really optimize perfectly for it anyway. And if you try to do that, you might be breaking the one thing that you really need to optimize, which is the stereo image. Okay, I hope, I hope that makes sense. I hope I didn't ramble too much and you could still follow me. But in order to make all this easier, I've got a workshop, a free workshop on AcousticsInsider.com, which I'll link in the description. It's the Phantom Speaker Test, which you, which you can follow, which guides you through this process step by step. It is possibly the most valuable information I've got on my website. It's absolutely free and you can sign up for it and go through it and all, all this placing your desk, placing your speakers question will be sorted for you if you just follow that procedure. All right, Nunya, and for everybody out there who's been wondering about this, I hope this cleared up all the contradictory information or gave you at least some perspective in relation to speaker placement with some of those con seemingly contradicting tips that you can find online. Let's leave it at that. Thanks for watching. As always, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. That's what it's all about. See you soon.